Hi everyone, and welcome back to Muscular Skeletal. So we're just going to pick up, this is uh, part two of the Muscular Skeletal System, and we're just going to pick up right where we left off in the PowerPoint. So before we get started, just a reminder that you have a final exam coming up, and um, it is cumulative, and um, you want to give yourself lots of time to review the material um, and work with each other to answer questions. Okay. <clears throat> In addition, I'd like you to consider something as you come to the end of the semester and you start planning for your break. Um, I want you to consider doing something kind and beneficial to your musculoskeletal system. Uh, I guess more as a more as a daily reminder of uh, that we do not take it for granted, and so. Please consider doing something new and challenging for your musculoskeletal system. For example, if you're somebody who always runs and that's what you do, I want you to consider doing something different like, um, like swimming, like water aerobics, yoga, or isometrics, perhaps even weightlifting on a minor scale. If you're someone who only does weights and, and that's kind of your thing that you do, I want you to consider doing some new cardio, something light uh, that will keep your heart rate up for a little while. So you're mixing things up and challenging your body in a new way so that you actually continue to progress um, to a more healthy, balanced fitness level. Okay. And of course, you can always study and exercise at the same time. You, you will find out ways to do that. <laughs> okay, so we left off on um, a discussion about kind of the bone matrix, okay, and osteoporosis. So as you can remember in the last lecture, we talked about how there's a certain rate of new bone being formed and old bone being resorbed, right, and the different cells that do each. So you remember the osteoblast and the osteoclast, okay? Now, osteoporosis, we've all heard of. We probably all know someone who has it. And I want you to think about who it is that you know who has osteoporosis. What gender are they? How old are they? What's their lifestyle like? Okay, do they have osteoporosis in the family? And my guess is that you'll see a pattern between all of you and in, in, in the people that you're thinking about. Most likely that person is female. Most likely that person has already experienced menopause. There may or may not be a family genetic link, right? Um, they may not be heavy weight bearing exercisers, okay? So this is just, this is not a coincidence, but this is actually the type of person um, that traditionally suffers from osteoporosis. So what is it? Is it some like magical, mysterious disease? No, not at all, actually. Um, it's our normal process of bone breakdown and bone rebuilding, except the bone breakdown part of the process is happening too fast. And the normal bone rebuilding is happening at the same pace, therefore not fast enough to catch up with the resorption, okay? <clears throat> now, we usually don't catch this until what happens? There's a couple reasons that we would catch osteoporosis in the same age. One, you're screened at um, a certain age, okay? Usually screening starts around age 65 in females. But what would be another reason that we would catch osteoporosis? for a patient that comes in? And the answer is fractures, okay? You're gonna have someone come in for a fracture that doesn't make sense for the way that the injury happened. You know, um, I tripped over my cat and I fell slightly into my chair or into my soft couch and I broke my leg or I broke my arm or something like that, okay? So it, it's, now it's not always that minimal of a, 
Um, maybe it's just a fall to the ground and fractures. But it doesn't make sense for the – you shouldn't be getting a fracture from that type of um, – Injury, okay, and then we do a DEXA scan and we see that this patient has pretty severe osteoporosis. And so not only are we treating the fracture, but we're also treating the osteoporosis, which had been missed up until then. So the nurse is conducting a health screening for osteoporosis. Which client is at greatest risk for developing this disorder? So take a minute to think about the options and pick your best answer. Okay, so hopefully you all kind of went to the elderly um, patients first and you ruled out the younger ones. Okay, you have a 25 year old woman who jogs. Well, clearly we are not concerned about her immediate elimination. 36 year old man who has asthma. Does he have any risk factors for osteoporosis? No. 70 year old man who consumes excess alcohol is 70 years old. Uh, a risk factor? Yes. Is being a man a risk factor? Not as much as being a woman, right? Women are the ones that are at risk. Excess alcohol consumption? Yes. Okay, so we've got two there. Now we have a sedentary 65-year-old woman who smokes cigarettes. Okay, sedentary lifestyle. Is this someone who's doing a lot of weight-bearing exercises that uses the bones? No, because remember, bones form because we're using them. So when we're laying around on the couch all day, our body decides it's not as useful to rebuild necessarily as much bone. We have to be using it. That's why weight-bearing exercises are fantastic, even if you're just walking. 65 years old, is that a number that we should be considering a risk factor? Yes. Woman. Is the fact that she's a woman important? Yes. She's postmenopausal age. Yes. Smoke cigarettes. Is that a risk factor? Yes. So that is your clear and obvious best choice there. Now, what are examples of non-weight bearing exercises in case your patient asks you? They tell you, but but I swim all the time. I'm a swimmer. Like I do water aerobics every two days. Why am I at risk? I feel like I do a lot. Okay. Those are not considered weight bearing exercises. Those are fantastic, but they're not weight bearing. Bicycling, not weight bearing. Okay. If they need options, a lot of um, the older population, a great one to consider is dancing, um, ballroom dancing or dancing with a partner or dancing lessons. Fantastic weight bearing exercise. A lot of um, that generation uh, grew up dancing a lot, and so that's very important and very um, joyful. You could also mention um, walking with uh, a, a friend. Walking with a friend, it's always safer when you are at risk age-wise for falls and things to always have a friend that you walk with up and down hills with cracks in the sidewalk and stuff. Um <clears throat> So those are all really great ideas. So continuing with causes of osteoporosis. So what's going to cause the resorption rate to pick up and, you know, the, the building rate um, not, okay? So decreased levels of estrogen and testosterone. So that's why women who have menopause, who have already, excuse me, experienced menopause and are not taking hormone replacement. They are going to be at a higher risk there. Okay, Decreased activity level. Well, uh, we see that as we age. Okay, Inadequate levels of vitamin D and C and magnesium. What's important about vitamin D versus... Okay, let me go back. What's important about having vitamin D that affects your calcium? If you remember when we learned about links between different vitamins and things. You need vitamin D in order to absorb calcium in your body. So that's very, very important to remember. 
if you don't have the vitamin D levels, it doesn't matter how much calcium you take in through your diet because everything's supplemented with calcium. But if you notice, a lot of things that have calcium now have vitamin D added. Look at your milk. Look at your um, yogurt. Look at your other dairy products. Things that have a ton of calcium, they now add vitamin D because this has been such an issue and it's just not public knowledge, unfortunately. So this is one of the things we have to actually um, teach our patients about. One, of, one out of every two American Caucasian women greater than the age of 50 years old will sustain at least one fragility fracture in their lifetime. One out of two. Okay. 24% of patients with hip fractures die within the first year of injury. So that's almost a quarter. So one out of every four patients that gets a hip fracture will die in the first year of that hip fracture, which is terrifying. Um, one question you may have already asked yourself or you started pondering was, why is it that we're not seeing men as often with osteoporosis? Like what What's happening here? So men actually start with a higher bone density from the very beginning. And this is, a, this is across the board by sex. So men have a higher bone density. So even though they also are losing bone, by the time they actually reach osteoporosis levels that are symptomatic or dangerous, it's very, very late in life. It's not at 65. It'll be like maybe at 85, 90, okay? And we could argue that it's not fair as females or maybe the males think it is fair, but there's a, you know, there must have been a um, advantageous reason for that. Um, but regardless, it's important to know, you know, there's exceptions, always. So kind of something interesting that I wanted to mention is that if you're thinking about weight-bearing exercises needed to maintain bone density, what do you think is going to happen to astronauts in outer space who are up there for a year or two? They have no gravity, and they're not, they're not able to do weight-bearing exercises. So what do you think happened to them every time they came back down to Earth? They had uniform osteoporosis. That means osteoporosis throughout the entire body that was almost equivalent because they weren't using weight-bearing exercises of any kind. Um, it was unpreventable for a long time and now they finally found ways to simulate similar issue, similar um, exercises so that they can prevent some of the osteoporosis. But there's some level also that continues. The other thing I want to point out, so we talked about vitamin D and calcium here. I also want to talk about the relationship between plasma calcium and phosphate concentrations. Okay, what do you remember about calcium and phosphate from last semester? Hopefully you remember they have an inverse, a proportionally inverse relationship. Okay, so that means, as a review, that if you have high levels of phosphate, Okay, in your blood, you will have lower levels of calcium. And one of the ways that people get high levels of phosphate, it's, you may or may not remember this, but it's actually from Coca-Cola. Um, not, all, not all bubbly products have high levels of phosphate, but uh, Coca-Cola products do. Um, and you'll have to kind of read up about that. So they'll actually, if you're drinking Diet Coke or Coke or whatever, they'll actually tell these women to stop doing that, stop drinking it, or to at least cut down to one can instead of three, or whatever it may be. Um, there's quite a few th um, different products out there that have phosphate, high phosphate levels, and you'll just need to kind of check that out yourself. Um, high phosphatemia is... is that's going to actually cause a problem is going to be greater than 4.5 milligrams per deciliter. Okay. All right. 
Let's move on here. Um, actually, you know, something we didn't talk about, but I just, I'm not sure if you're covering this in MedSurge, just a little review. Treatment of osteoporosis is going to include biphosphonates. Those are the first line. It's a class of medication we're going to talk about later. It reduces bone resorption rates and obviously the weight-bearing exercises we talked about. So um, if you see patients walking around uh, with kyphosis, um, remember kyphosis is that like hunchback look? A lot of times that's actually due to severe osteoporosis. And we talked about the screening over the age of 65. And we do what's called a DEXA scan, which is a double or dual x-ray absorptiometry, it's called, scan. And it actually looks at how dense your bone is. So the more dense your bone, the less x-rays that will actually go through it. So it's kind of easy for them to figure it out. And then finally for vitamin D, don't forget to inform your patients that they can get vitamin D through sunlight, endogenous vitamin D takes a little bit more work on the body's end, but um, that is also, that is a possibility. Okay, now I'm comfortable moving on. Osteomalacia, or malacia, however you want to pronounce it. So we're going to talk about it, and then I want you to tell me, it reminds you of another disease that we see in children. Um, <clears throat> so we're mainly talking about deficiency of vitamin D, okay, which we just talked about, right? Um, which lowers the absorption of calcium from the intestines, okay? And you guys all know that very well. Now, what does calcium actually do to the bones, okay? Calcium is what gives the bone the, the strength, the mineralization, the calcification, okay? If you think of something calcifying, you think of this hard crystal rock thing forming, right? And so... If you don't have that happening because you don't have enough calcium, but your bones are still forming, guess what? You're going to have soft bones. Um, what does that mean? Soft bone without calcium means that once you try to stand up or walk with those kinds of bones, do anything a normal body would do, you could get fractures. You're going to get things collapsing. So vertebral collapse is a terrible thing if you can imagine. Bone malformation, so as the bone is forming, it's soft, it's bending, it's breaking, and then it tries to remodel in the same terrible fashion, and you get bone malformation. It's very, very strange. So, um, possibilities of why you'd have a deficiency of vitamin D. Patients with celiac disease, which uh, is an intolerance to gluten, they have absorption issues, and they can have problems with absorbing vitamin D. Patients who have very low sunlight exposure in their environment, it's a possibility. A gastrectomy. So you guys remember if you take out a large part of your stomach, you're not going to be absorbing a lot of things as well. Um, different intestinal surgeries as well can affect it. Um, so we're, we're, we're really thinking about the absorption here of the vitamin D. Um, fish, tuna, and sardines have a very high vitamin D content, which I think is kind of neat. Now, so we're mainly talking about adults here, but what, what is this, what is a disease that's very similar but occurs in growing children? Rickets. Okay, so if you thought of rickets, you're absolutely right. Okay, same kind of thing. All right, true or false, as aging occurs, bone resorption accelerates, decreasing bone mass and predisposing the patient to injury. Would you say that's true or false? Absolutely true. Good job. Okay, Paget's disease, which you've probably heard of, also caught osteitis deformans for reasons we're going to see. So this is when a patient has increased metabolic activity in the bone. So excessive bone uh, resorption uh, and bone remodeling. 
okay? Which leads to the deformans part, the deformity. So the bones are being broken down and regrowing way too fast. Um, and softened bone, again, we're talking about these soft bones, okay? Is softened bone is coming back, is being regrown. So it's a thicker bone, but it's weaker. It's very disorganized. Um, <clears throat> it, it doesn't have that clear um, organization as a uh, normal bone would. Usually affects the axial skeleton, and it's most common in other countries. The treatment for this is actually biphosphonates, again, which slows the rate of resorption, and calcitonin. You also need a specialist on hand. So this kind of disease can be triggered by uh, viral causes, genetic, genetic causes are considered. It's still relatively unknown and idiopathic. So a rheumatologist is actually the one that will treat this disease. So what do soft bones look like? Okay, so this is, this is an example. They start to bend, they start to thicken. The new bone, it's bigger, but it's weaker. It's filled with a bunch of new blood vessels, but the blood vessels, unfortunately, are taking place of the bone marrow that would have been there, which we all know the importance of. Now I want you to consider a thickened, soft bone. Okay, thickened, soft bones in the skull. What is going to happen to the brain if you have the breakdown and the regrowth of thickened bones? You're going to get brain compression, which is very, very dangerous. Now, all these things can be dangerous, of course, but skull malformation diseases are, are, are high up there. Um, you can actually get deafness, atrophy of the optic nerve, all related to changes in the skull, okay? Because you guys remember um, all of your cranial nerves and things. <clears throat> a lot of patients don't have symptoms for a long time, and they find it when they do an x-ray, and they find um, irregular bone trabeculi, again, with thickened and disorganized patterns. So we talked about that. Now here's actinel. So we've been mentioning biphosphonates for the treatment of a couple of these diseases so far. Um, this is an example of one, okay, that you probably have seen on the news or other um, advertisements. So these are first-line treatment, and they help increase bone density. So actinel, Boniva, Fosamax, and Reclass. Okay, are pretty common ones. I just wanted you to see it. Okay, and now we're moving on to osteomyelitis. And I want you to think about the last time that you saw osteomyelitis in the hospital. Um, <clears throat> what it looked like? What happened to that patient? Where was it at? Okay, what other comorbidities did they have? Because you're going to start to see the same patterns. Okay, so just take the word osteomyelitis. Okay. And you know that you have inflammation of some kind in the bone now, right? It has gotten into the bone. Now, it could be fungus. It could be, um, you know, something else. But most commonly, we're talking about bacteria. We're talking about bacteria. And I want you to kind of, while there are exceptions, I want you to think about bacteria getting into the bone and uh, an infection, okay? So most commonly, we're looking at these open wounds, okay? So what kind of patient is gonna come in with an open wound? It looks, say, in the foot, okay? And you're probably thinking of a diabetic patient. Think of all the patients you've found with open wounds, diabetic ulcers. They've stepped on something from their peripheral neuropathy. They stepped on a nail and they didn't know it for two weeks until they started to have a fever and and uh, leukocytosis and pain and, you know, chills, okay? They come into the hospital, we look underneath, we do an x-ray, and we find not only do they have this open wound, but the bacteria has now gotten into 
the wound and traveled into the bone and is spreading through the bone. Okay. So once this happens, it becomes a big deal. Um, it's scary on the provider's end. It's scary on the surgeon's end because once you start having a bad osteomyelitis, you start having bone death and you start having a spreading infection that you have to cut out. So that's why you will see a patient come in with uh, a diabetic ulcer. They do an x-ray, they do some lab works, and they decide to cut off a toe. Okay, The patient comes back to you. They're mourning the loss of their toe. They do another scan. They do another x-ray. They do more lab work. They follow the patient, and they realize the infection is still spreading, and they have to cut off part of the foot. So you will see this pattern happen within a, a, um, a course of hospital stay. I have seen a patient go from losing a toe to losing a part of the foot all the way up to a below the knee amputation as they chase this infection. Now clearly they're trying to make a decision where they save as much as possible. Okay, But the, the risk is if they do not cut it out the patient will get sepsis and die or will um, eventually lose, you know, the, the, the bacteria will spread through all the bones. So um, really there's not a lot of options other than to cut the infection out. Of course they're treating with antibiotics and everything at the same time. Um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to kind of paint that picture because that is the reality of what you're going to be seeing. Bone surgeries, trauma, uh, injected illegal drugs, and diabetes are the common causes for these wounds that happen and the, the introduction of a bacteria because it has to get in somehow, right? So you have to be thinking, well, how did it get in and then how did it spread? So here's kind of a picture. So you've got this initial infection you have the first stage, so you see just a little bit here, blood supply blocked, dead bone, okay, pus. Okay, so there's an abscess here. So um, it's scary, and remember the, the blood, the capillaries and blood that come in and out through here, okay. So it can get very nasty if you um, it, if you don't get rid of it quickly. The patient has systemic manifestations. So usually what we'll do is we'll we'll have them on four to six weeks of IV antibiotics. Again, four to six weeks of IV antibiotics, which as you guys know are the big guns. Um, any missing bone such as if there was a bunch of missing bone already, would be filled with a bone graft or packing. Um, blood cultures are always done to help diagnose this. Bone scans, MRIs, the bone, and needle aspirations of the area are used. And if you're wondering, well, how do you determine when an amputation is needed or not? It's whenever there's poor blood circulation to the area and the disease is spreading quickly. So um, it w isn't necessarily from diabetes, but could be. But we're more looking at blood circulation and spread of infection. Okay, so very much a big deal. Please pay attention to your patients that you see in the hospital and um, do as much as you can to learn about this one. It's a big one. Okay, moving on to a very different topic. Cartilage and bone. So cartilage is this beautiful, shiny cushion of stuff that our body makes for us that goes in between joints where two bones are going to be rubbing. Okay, so anytime you've got like that movement of of anything, so um, like in the in the knee joint, if you have uh, the femur, right? <clears throat> That's an example of a constantly moving um, joint. So if you look at this picture, what is wrong here? What is wrong with all of this here? And what do we call that? So you can clearly see over time, 
the breakdown of cartilage, right? And how do you think that's going to feel for this guy? Not so great, okay? It's going to be painful, uh, stiff, uncomfortable. What do you think it will sound like? It could make that like um, grating sound, clicking sound. Um, it's going to feel stiff in the morning, okay? So we don't have a way to easily repair this or replace it. Instead, we more or less manage the disease. Now, what is that disease called when you get this breakdown of cartilage? Hopefully, you said osteoarthritis, okay? Um, osteoarthritis is not a mystery. It's not something strange. It's very basic. It's very simple. And it happens with what? With time, okay? Time and reoccurrent use of a joint, okay? So if you're looking at a bricklayer, somebody who lays down bricks and uses primarily his right hand to grip and place and maneuver, you're going to see osteoarthritis in the right hand. The left hand may or may not show any signs of it, okay? Same thing goes if, you, um, if you're, you know, looking at a, uh, some, another type of athlete who tends to, let's say, like a soccer player that kicks primarily with one leg and not the other. You may see uh, osteoarthritis happen in the leg that's dominantly used and not in the other, okay? So the point is with osteoarthritis, are you looking at symmetric or asymmetric disease? Definitely asymmetric. Only the affected joints. Most of the time, we don't use our joints equivalently on both sides of the body. It'd probably be better if we did, but we don't. We have dominant hands, we have dominant feet. Um, we have dominant sports and or activities that we use. Some people use their hips a lot more than other people and get osteoarthritis there. I have osteoarthritis in my ankles already from repeated injuries and excessive use of my ankles. And so I'm, you know, that I'm gonna be dealing with that for the rest of my life. And I have to really um, be aware of that as I decide what things I'm gonna be doing um, with my body over the next 20, 30 years. So some of you are sitting there and you're wondering, well, do I have arthritis? Well, the chances are, if you played any sports through most of your childhood, through, I don't know, maybe early college years, yes, you do. And, and I'm not saying that to depress you because it's not depressing, you know, it's just what happens. Um, yeah, you probably do. And you're probably gonna have issues with arthritis earlier than perhaps somebody who did not do as much excessive weight-bearing um, exercises. And you know what, that's just something that, you know, we deal with. So um, not, not a bad thing, but it is, you know, it is a problem, can cause issues down the line. Uh, another review is reviewing the synovial membrane, because we're going to talk about this as well. So remember we talked about bursa a while back. Right, the last lecture. And bursa are on the outside of the joints. There are these little pockets or pillows. So the synovial membrane and then the synovial fluid is actually in between the joints. It's in the joint, okay, as opposed to the bursa, which are outside the joint. Normal synovial fluid is going to be a viscous egg white consistency. It tends to have kind of a, um, it has protein in it, it has glucose in it. It has WBCs, RBCs, and it tends to be, um, although it's kind of an egg white consistency, it tends to be clear. Um, it's a lubrication for the joint, easy movement. And we usually have about 0.15 to 4 milliliters of this fluid depending on the joint. Okay. Now, knowing all of that, what do you think an infected or inflamed synovial fluid would look like, knowing what the normal one looks like. How do you think we would detect that the synovial fluid was perhaps um, infected of some kind? So clearly we would have to do a joint fluid aspiration. So we'd actually have to go in with a needle, pull out some of this fluid and look at it, okay? So things that could indicate infection. 
one, increased amounts of fluid. So if you have more than four milliliters in an area that should only have four, okay, you know most likely the inflammatory process is occurring, right? What um, color or characteristics do you think an inflamed, infected synovial fluid would have? So usually it's cloudy or pink or both. And um, another interesting thing that we would find, if it was less viscous. So naturally it's a very viscous fluid. If it is less viscous, usually inflammation is going on and other um, plasma has gotten in there. Okay. So these are all reviews to get us ready. Okay. So there's fl inflammatory and non-inflammatory joint diseases. Alrighty. <clears throat> um, there's a lot of differences between inflammatory and non-inflammatory, but inflammatory joint diseases, you're going to see those systemic changes. So you're going to see systemic signs of inflammation, such as increased WBCs, fever, um, general feeling of unwellness, person's going to stop eating, okay? And you guys know these so well now that... It's going to make sense, okay? That, that's an inflamed, inflamed joint. It's, it's, very, it's very different, okay? It can be infectious or non-infectious. But we're actually going to talk about osteoarthritis first, okay? Now, OA or osteoarthritis. Are you going to have, is this patient going to have fever, leukocytosis, and all that stuff that we just talked about with a degenerative disc disease? No, right? No, okay, so we talked about how um, some of us have arthritis already in our ankles or knees, maybe a basketball player, runner. Okay, they don't have fever and leukocytosis, leukocytosis and all of that right now. Um, but I have lost articular cartilage, okay. And when you lose articular cartilage, this is when you start to have bone spurs forming. So the bone spurs could form anywhere. They could form in the hand, they could form in the foot, they could form in the knees, the arms, okay? Bone spurs are when the bones start rubbing against each other and the osteoblasts decide, oh, I guess it's time to start forming new bone, okay? Because we don't have that cartilaginous layer anymore to lubricate, okay? Um, you can actually get a deformity of the joint if you have too much of that bone spur uh, process happening. I'm sorry, I said degenerative disc disease earlier, and I meant to say degenerative joint disease because degenerative disc disease is specific to the vertebral discs. It's the same process, but I just want to clarify. So, is osteoarthritis going to get worse or better with age and time. It's always going to get worse, okay, because you're going to use the joint more over time. Okay, do you think that the joint can get larger based on this picture? Yes, okay, depends on how much of the bone spurs you have forming ossification. Okay, it could get a larger joint. Um, do you think there's tenderness in the joint? Yeah, absolutely. So I get, you know, tenderness in my ankles even, you know, now. So I can expect that to worsen. Um, limited motion in the joint. Yeah, definitely. Uh, with more severity, more pain, and more deformity, you certainly could. What's crazy is there's nodes, okay? There's different nodes that you can get forming. Um, they're called different names depending on where they're located, okay? You can also get nodes forming and deformities in the hands for rheumatoid arthritis, and we're going to go over those, but do not mix those up with osteoarthritis because these are very different, okay? These are going to be the areas of high impact that you're going to see these. So if you're thinking about repeated stress on joints, what types of patients... What kind of history um, do you think these patients had in terms of exercise um, or health? 
you just kind of think about them. Who, who's going to suffer from wear and tear? Okay. So according to our book, marathon runners, long distance runners in the same category, uh, gymnasts, gymnasts have arthritis in multiple joints over time. And obese people. So the excess weight over a period of years will cause osteoarthritis in the joints. Okay, It is enough extra weight to cause heightened and acceler accelerated osteoarthritis. So it's another reason for our patients to um, work on getting to a healthy BMI. Construction workers and bricklayers tend to have more um, osteoarthritis in the fingers, hands, shoulders, um, and wrists. And um, specifically, when you have someone who had a previous um, ACL or meniscus uh, injury or tearing, they have increased risk for knee arthritis. And um, athletes that played basketball... Not, it doesn't have to be a current basketball player, but if they had years of playing basketball, soccer, or football, much higher incidences of osteoarthritis compared to other sports. So if you have this patient with these little nodules, this pain, um, what are we going to do for them? Resting the joint, does that do anything for them? What do you think? If it hurts when they're using it, do you think resting will help? Yeah, it usually does relieve the pain. Um, the other thing is there's a lot of joint stiffness that occurs with both osteoarthritis and rheumatoid. Okay, And it's important to talk about the difference. With osteoarthritis, the patient will feel stiff, but it'll go away usually within eh, 20 minutes. Okay, ideally of using the joint. Um, it, it, in other words, it dissipates pretty quickly. It could be even sooner than that. With rheumatoid arthritis, the stiffness remains after an hour. It takes a long time to go away. You can have that crepitous, creaking, grating sound with osteoarthritis. And the pain is usually associated with the weight bearing, the load bearing, or the use of that joint versus not. Another thing to mention is, remember we talked about those bone spurs, okay? You'll see them referred to as osteophytes. Um, there is a risk when you have osteophytes growing out from underneath the bone, they can actually break off and irritate the synovial membrane, causing um, what's called synovitis. So that's just kind of something to keep in mind. It's just, it's a further complication that can happen. The varus deformity is a severe knee osteoarthritis. So we do x-rays, we do MRIs, which can show cartilage and soft tissue. Um, we use these to help diagnose osteoarthritis. And treatment, we already talked about rest. Range of motion exercises helps prevent joint contraction. It, you know, it's easy when you have pain in a joint to not want to use it at all. And that's not what we want to say. Um, we just want you to do it in moderation and maybe with the use of maybe some assistive devices such as uh, cane, crutches, walker, if you have any extra weight, you want to lose the extra weight to make it easier on your joints. You can take anti-inflammatory medications, of course. Um, <clears throat> surgery sometimes is an option. And, and we were talking about obesity as a risk factor earlier, but I guess I want you to consider the fact that obese patients are five times as likely to have osteoarthritis of the hip. And someone who is not obese. So five times as likely. Okay. All right. So we're test you a little bit here on your osteoarthritis versus rheumatoid. Okay. Rheumatoid arthritis is caused over time with weight bearing exercises, true or false? And the answer is 
false, right? Osteoarthritis is caused over time with weight-bearing exercises. Second one, osteoarthritis manifests bilaterally while rheumatoid arthritis manifests unilaterally. Unilaterally, true or false? Hopefully you screamed out false clearly. Um, it's the opposite, right? Yeah. Okay. So now we move away from OA and into rheumatoid arthritis. Now NCLEX loves to test on these, so make sure you clearly have these understood. Okay. So what is the cause of rheumatoid arthritis? It is autoimmune. Okay. It is inflammatory. It is systemic and it is chronic. Okay. Now knowing that it's autoimmune, What is happening in the body that you know of? Basically, the body has decided to attack itself, okay, some of its positive antigens, some of its self-antigens that are located in the joints, um, in the ligaments, in the tendons, and in the cartilage. It's pretty bad news. I mean, it's, it's uh, not a good disease at all, okay? Now... What triggers autoimmune diseases? Always. What do we What do we know triggers them? Some previous infection, right? Um, a virus, perhaps. Uh, trauma, stress. There's all these different things that can lead to autoimmune diseases. It's never super clear what happens. Now, particularly in this disease, there is a particular antibody that's created that starts attacking the host tissues. Okay. They are called, these antibodies are called rheumatoid factors, hence the name rheumatoid arthritis. So, <clears throat> destruction of the synovial joints is part of this disease because it's part of the area that's attacked. It leads to disability and also premature death is a possibility. Okay. Um, can there be a genetic part? Yes, there could be. Um, and then in terms of treatment, what do you think we would do to treat these patients with this autoimmune rheumatoid arthritis? We would give them DMARDs, which I know you guys have heard of, disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, immunosuppressants, and steroids. What do you think that's going to do to this patient's immune system? You're giving them immunosuppressants and steroids on top of DMARDs. They are going to be high risk for secondary infection, right? And if you look at these joints, okay, normal hand versus one with bone erosion, bone displacement. I mean, look at this deformity. It's much more severe than the one we saw in OA. So you have joint swelling and tenderness, of course. Okay. Now, what's the difference? If you were to look at a patient with rheumatoid arthritis and look at their hands, and then look at a patient with osteoarthritis and look at their hands, what's going to be the difference in how they feel? These hands with RA are going to be what? Warm, hot, swollen. Is it going to be both of their hands bilaterally or just one in rheumatoid? Both of them. Okay, it's not going to be one side of the body. It's a systemic disease. It happens in both sides equally. And you can see the amount of inflammation. So you're going to have swelling, inflammation, heat, redness, all that stuff we talked about. Um, very, very different from the other one. Uh, the, the warm to the touch part is something you'd feel uh, pretty clearly different. These patients will have fever. They will have fatigue. They will have weakness, weight loss, general aching, malaise, okay? They have that stiffness we talked about upon waking, but it's usually for a whole hour before it starts to uh, dissipate. 
and now we're back to um, you know, being awake and moving around a little bit. So you can kind of see how we would diagnose or find out about RA. So we talked about the first one, arthritis of three or more joint areas that comes about at the same time, okay? Because this is gonna come on pretty quickly once it happens. Hand joints are involved, it's symmetric, both sides of the body equally. You know, those nodules with rheumatoid factors inside. Okay, abnormal amounts of serum rheumatoid and the radiographic changes that, that we just saw. So remember I said you can still have nodules with RA, but they're different. Okay, remember the other ones were found in different areas for OA. With RA, it's a little different. They're in different spots, and you can get this um, deformity here. Okay, you have changes in the bones as well, the big, the big bones as well. Um, before we move on, actually, I'd like to mention that with RA and any kind of autoimmune disease, it's not as simple as saying, oh, this is, you know, attacking the musculoskeletal system. It actually, because it's an autoimmune systemic disease, it can affect um, other organs such as the skin, eyes, lungs, or blood vessels. Uh, it doesn't always happen, uh, but it can happen. Um, yeah, so just, just be aware of the fact that any autoimmune disease can be much greater than a simple system. It's going to cover multiple systems. Okay. So moving on. The nurse is caring for a patient with a diagnosis of gout. Which laboratory value would the nurse expect to note in this patient? So hopefully you remember with gout, we're talking about uric acid building up. A normal uric acid level is 2.5 to 8 milligrams per deciliter. Okay, and when you go above the 8.0, you actually start to have crystals forming, uric acid crystals, which cause the gout symptoms. So there's two main causes of having this uric acid buildup, okay, because it's obvi obviously abnormal to have these high levels. First cause, it could be excessive uric acid production in the body. Second cause, it could be under excretion of uric acid by the kidneys, okay, which leads to a buildup. Which one do you think is most of the cases? May surprise you. 90% of the cases are from under excretion of the uric acid by the kidneys. Only 10% is from excessive uric acid production. It's just kind of interesting. What kind of patients are we talking about? If you were to paint a perfect picture of somebody who's likely to have gout, male or female? Male. What age? 40 to 50 tends to be when they'll have their first gouty attack. They eat a lot of red meat. <laughs> um, so we have to talk about purine. So let me move forward for a second. Okay, so, so in order for the body to create uric acid, purine has to be ingested and broken down by the body, okay? And if you talk to anyone who has gout and you say, what triggered your attack? They will tell you that they ate or drank something that they should not have, that they know kind of triggers... Um, the production of uric acid. Look at all the delicious things on this list. And what's missing from here is red wine. Please add red wine on there. That's a huge trigger. Um, scallops, oh, red meat, organ meats. Okay, interesting enough, high fructose corn syrup. Okay, so a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of deliciousness here. Okay, now I'm going to move backwards again. <clears throat> so 
So when you look at the clinical stages, so you can first just be not having symptoms, okay? And that's going to be first stage. Next, you're going to have the what's called a gout attack or a gouty attack. And that's when you start to have that pain. It's a very bad pain. If you've known someone with gout, they'll usually tell you these classic places that they have gout, right? It's usually the great big toe. Uh, the knee is huge. It's usually just one side. Um, and then, okay, so then they have these attacks. And then if it's repeated, like usually over the course of three years or so or more, then they start to have tophaceous gout, which is where they actually get tophi. Tophi are these permanent nodules that will be in different parts of the body, like the tip of the elbow, the toes, the ears, um, vocal cords can get them, spinal cords can get them as well. Well, about 50% of the attacks are in the great big toe. The other 50% are usually in the heel, ankle, knee, wrist, elbow, or instep of the foot. Okay. Now, why do you think 50% of the cases where uric acid crystals form are in the great big toe. Because this is really interesting that a physician told me that I would have never guessed. So the reason why, actually, is the great big toe is the coolest temperature of all the other areas where um, crystals can form. And part of crystal formation is having a cooler temperature for it to come together. So you have to have this perfect storm. So you have the uric acid levels are high, and you have this cool area in the toe, and bam, now you have a crystal there, a uric acid crystal, and it hurts really bad, okay? So then what does the patient experience? A hot, red, painful toe. Okay, it's hot to the touch. It is red. It hurts a lot. Okay. Tends to start at night for a lot of patients when, again, you're coolest, right? Um, and it will get swollen, and it usually can last for hours to a couple days. Okay. All right. So just do be familiar with um, purines and its connection to uric acid very interesting. Okay, skeletal muscle review. We're going to go into a couple details here. So, disuse atrophy is something we have to talk about because we see a lot of this in our patients. You can see it mildly in somebody who um, had a cast on for a period of time, took off the cast, and they had muscle atrophy in that arm that leg or whatever it may be because they weren't able to use the muscle. If someone's on bed rest, their whole body will atrophy. Trauma can do that. Nerve damage, actually. We need our nerves to send signals from the brain to the muscles to contract. So if we have nerve damage that's severe enough that messages cannot be sent, we will get atrophy. Okay, so um, neuro diseases can cause disuse atrophy as well. Um, the best way to prevent disuse atrophy is to do isometric exercises. So even if you, you know, let's say you broke both your legs and not able to walk around, you can still do um, isometric exercises with your upper body. And even with the muscles that are not affected by the by the um, fracture in your lower body, you can still do isometric exercises with your abdomen, your back, and your core. So it's really important. Okay. Other things that you can see, contractures. So contractures are, are going to happen when, and you can see it right here, an example of a contracture when there's a either a failure of the calcium pump okay which is usually temporary or b a pathological uh, reason such as muscle spasm muscle weakness 
You could have scar tissue in the flexor joint, um, which burn, burn patients have a lot of. So you will see contractures and burn patients in different parts of the body due to uh, scar tissue in different joints and muscular dystrophy. Okay, stress-induced muscle tension. We don't need to talk about that because we're in nursing school and we've all experienced that. But do be aware of clenching teeth, hand your hand grip, okay, headaches, neck stiffness, and chronic anxiety because these are all very real thing, real um, disorders that can lead to changes in your skeletal muscle system. So if you want to, you can close your eyes and I'm going to read this to you so you can imagine this patient. I have fibromyalgia. It doesn't mean I'm lazy. It's not all in my head and I'm not trying to get attention. It's not an excuse, it's a curse, but I still live my life. I work hard to bridge the gap between what I feel I can do and what I need to get done. It is a battle every day to do the little things you take for granted. So if I don't seem handicapped to you, that shows how hard I'm trying. Yes, I can walk, but it hurts. Yes, I can work, but it hurts. I can do everything you can do, but it hurts a lot. Okay, and, and I would say the patients that I have seen with fibromyalgia they can't actually really honestly do the work that we do on a normal basis and live the, the, stam, the high stamina life that we do on a daily basis. Um, you know, nursing, an accelerated nursing program would be next to impossible with the amount of pain and fatigue these patients feel. So fibromyalgia is still a pretty new disease. Um, you're not going to see a lot of it, a lot about it yet in the books or in the research, but it's coming. I've known many people with it and they, they have chronic widespread pain in their muscles and the pain is overly sensitized. So for example, I did massage on a couple patients who had fibromyalgia and I can't show you, but if you could just take your fingertip and brush it as lightly as possible on the skin, on your skin, so that it tickles. That was how hard I could go on my patient. And that felt like a deep tissue massage for her and for my other patients. It was very much the same across the board. Um, a lot of times we see previous triggers to this disease by um, chronic fatigue syndrome. That's what I saw the most of. Uh, some people had just a flu, some other kind of virus that triggered it. Lyme disease, emotional trauma absolutely can be linked, um, physical trauma as well. Uh, they think that there's a possible connection to the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis alteration that is causing um, fibromyalgia to start showing up. But, you know, to be honest, we don't even know how many patients have it because it's just now, it's so hard to diagnose and it's just now being um, considered a real disease by providers who previously thought it was more of a somebody complaining a lot kind of thing. So just know that that stigma is out there. They don't have something that they're not wearing a cast. They don't, you know, they don't wear a sign that says, I feel horrible all the time but they do. So please take it very seriously when you meet somebody with this. Okay, so polymyositis and dermatomyositis, you can kind of figure out what myositis means. Um, muscle pain, things that are attacking the skeletal muscle system. So it can be viral, bacterial, parasitic, um, Toxoplasmosis is one that I think is kind of interesting because they always really talk about um, pregnant women not changing litter boxes 
for cats. And because this parasite, Toxoplasma, lives there, it's very few symptoms, um, but it's very severe consequences in a newly infected um, pregnant woman. So they're not supposed to be doing that at all. And it can cause uh, muscle pain and muscle disease as well. And so you're seeing kind of a combination of different um, possible symptoms or manifestations from these diseases, which your book, you know, goes into a little bit. So do review that. I want to spend a little bit of time on toxic myopathy. So the most common cause is alcohol abuse. Okay, and I want to talk about this because, well, realistically, you're going to see a lot of this. Um, quite a few people in the world that abuse alcohol. I would love for you to go on up to date and just honestly just um, read about alcohol and its effects on the human body because you're going to be blown away by what you find because it affects every single system of the body. So a toxic myopathy is one where muscle damage has been caused by drugs or toxins directly. Okay. Um, and eventually you can get necrosis of the individual muscle fibers, which is a little terrifying. And I want to read you something. So the severe form of acute alcoholic myopathy is associated with the sudden onset of muscle pain, swelling, and weakness. Okay, muscle pain, swelling, and weakness, which is the same thing that we've got up here. And this is from up to date. So it's called acute alcoholic myopathy. You also get red urine, red-tinged urine caused by myoglobin, which you guys remember is muscle being broken down, right? And a rapid rise in muscle enzymes. Symptoms worsen over hours to a few days, and then they improve over the next week as the patient is withdrawn from alcohol. So literally, this attack, which is horrible and feels like you're dying, it goes away if you just stop drinking the toxin, okay? But we know that once these patients are treated, quite often they will go back out into the world in which they live and they will be compelled to drink again and they will come back for a similar um, attack. Now, there are homeless patients that we see come through the ER who explain that they're having this muscle pain and this and that and swelling and I've seen so many times people just look at them like you're making this up so you can stay here but actually it's a very very real possibility that they are having um, this acute alcoholic myopathy. In patients who abuse alcohol over many years Chronic alcohol, alcoholic myopathy may develop, and this is even stranger. So symptoms include painless weakness of the limb muscles closest to the trunk and the girdle, um, including the thighs, hips, shoulders, and upper arms. This weakness develops gradually over weeks or months. Um, they get muscle atrophy, which may be striking. So you may see someone on the streets who has what looks like complete muscle atrophy, which could be long-term alcohol abuse. The nerves of the extremities may also break, begin to break down, which is known as alcoholic peripheral neuropathy, which can add to the person's difficulty in moving. So now we're talking about muscle weakness, pain, swelling, and permanent damage to the nerve, to the nerves, to, um, the person's ability to move. I mean, it's uh, it's shocking. Anyway, that is for, I guess, another day to discuss, but I just wanted you to know that and to start paying attention to um, patients who are al alcohol abusers. Okay. Now, bone tumors, we, we talked about kind of how to determine which ones are going to be more malignant versus not. Um, 
So if you have, let me test you here, osteosarcoma. So if you are just looking at this word, osteosarcoma, is this a malignant or a benign tumor? Yes, hopefully you said malignant, right? Because you remember sarcoma are malignant tumors. Um, I do want you to know osteosarcoma because it's a, it's a big one. It's the most common malignant bone tumor. Okay, so please study up on that one. Um, in terms of the rest of the bone tumors, I do want you to be familiar with where they're at based on the name and a little bit about them. Uh, osteosarcoma, um, osteochondroma, I would like you to know because it's the most common benign bone tumor. Chondroblastoma, I would like you to know um, as well. All right, and I think that brings us to an end. Um, remember to use a combination of all of your resources to study for your final, including your um, unit objectives, your PowerPoints, the lectures, um, your forums, and your book. And, you know, remember that your, your medical surgical textbook has pathophysiology as well as your pathophysiology textbook, and it's wise to use both. Um, and not to just use one resource. And I hope you guys um, have a wonderful week, and I will I will see you very very soon. And please email me with any questions. And um, best of luck studying. Thanks so much. Bye bye.